Uh, good evening and welcome to Argonne National Laboratory. I'm Greg Crumdick, the Director of the Applied Materials Division. It's my pleasure to welcome you to this installment of the Out Loud Lecture Series. Should be an especially interesting talk. Uh, manufacturing it plays a key role in the Chicagoland area, and we're pleased to see this much industrial in, uh, uh, support from the community for this type of a presentation. Uh, as you may know, the mission of Argonne National Laboratory is to accelerate science and technology that drives U.S. prosperity and security. That's why it's my special honor to introduce our lecturer who will share with us a preview of chapters to come in the Argonne story. Santanu Chardway, the director of the Manufacturing Science and Engineering Initiative here at Argonne, helps develop programs to expand the capabilities using high-performance computing, developing uh, computer models to help develop new materials and processes for manufacturing. Santana received his PhD in materials chemistry and chemistry physics from Stony Brook University. As a grad student, he received a NATO fellowship uh, to work at Oxford University, developing simulations for ionic conductors, catalyst, and battery materials. Before coming to Argonne, Santanu worked at Brookhaven National Laboratory, Washington State University, and the University of Illinois at Champaign. Uh, Champaign. Uh, he maintains a joint appointment professorship at uh, UIC. Please welcome Santanu Chardry. Thanks, Greg. Thanks, everybody. Thanks uh, for your time. Uh, and uh, we'll spend uh, the next hour talking about uh, science of advanced manufacturing. The science of advanced manufacturing is an odd title uh, because uh, when you think about the word manufacturing, uh, you think about a factory. Uh, the smoke's coming out. People uh, kind of end of the lunch uh, or end of the shift walking out with the lunch box in the hand. Uh, that created all the jobs, uh, middle class jobs. People grew family. First generation of college goers went to college uh, working in factories, mills that produced lots of goods. We really sent product out far part of the world because we can produce more than we consume and other people would like to have our product. That's kind of story where we start. And the picture starts changing uh, when uh, in 1913, Henry Ford comes and says that, you know what, I'll turn this company that makes you know, tens of car per month into this behemoth that makes the car in an assembly line. It sounds like a simple concept and probably you guys know this story. Henry Ford got this idea from Chicago Meat Packers the whole idea of an assembly line, it came from Chicago meat packers. He was really amazed by the meat packers. By the way, it's, I think it's funny that this was not called an assembly line in Chicago. It was a disassembly line, of course. <laughs> so it was a very interesting story to me that they got the idea. It's in the Henry Ford Museum in, in, in Dearborn that he got this idea from Chicago. And he said that I'm going to make the car exactly this way. You know, this is a simple step. It, 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 is, it is essentially somebody is pulling something, and he divided this 3,000 parts that made Ford Model T into this 84 steps. In each station, he stationed people. He said that, okay, you guys all stand here, you do this, and you do this, and broken this up. And the production rate went through roof from 11 cars to 92 minutes per making one Model T, okay? This is an amazing transformation because he not only increased productivity, increased actually number of people employed, reduced uh, safety incidents because people are not moving around anymore. They're not bumping into each other. They're not dumping things on each other. And he reduced the cost of Ford Model T from $800 to $350. <laughs> so that would be $15,000 to $10,000 or something like that by today's money. But anyway, it is a big reduction and made Ford Model T the car of the masses. Now, if you look at uh, this innovation, it then spread everywhere. Everybody adopted for different things. And we want, went through the wars. We went to World War II. And our production machine, our assembly line, kept us winning the war. Because we can make them at the rate we consume them. And that was the biggest innovation that drove a lot of our prosperity and the technology that was needed. I will introduce this gentleman. His name is George Duvall. George Duvall didn't go to college. He's from Louisville, Kentucky. He's an amazing inventor. 
he actually invented uh, the microwave machine for making food, the oven. So he kept making new things. The one you see here uh, is his invention, is the first robotic arm. Uh, it's a very simple device. Uh, he, only, you know, he found it very hard uh, to sell it. Nobody wants to buy it. It was like, what is this thing? Like, what is he gonna do? He sold it to General Motors. General Motors used it to, you know, in a die casting plant from moving something one to the other place. George Duvall was really great. Japan really liked it. We didn't, so they imported it. It's like, okay, this is great. We, we want to really invest in it. But Unimate, in 1954, 1961, he formed a company called Unimo Unimotion Robotics and Universal Robots. And the industrial automation and industrial robot transformed industry again. If you look at a car plant right now, it looks something like this. All these things that you see, these are versions of robotic arm. Of course, it has improved tremendously. And we're talking about you know, different motion axis, 20, 28 axis, automation, you name it. But this is how factories look like. What you see has changed is people, right? You don't see a whole lot of people. Robots are doing lots and lots of work. There's interesting tidbits about uh, Argon. Uh, you know, Isaac Asimov in 1940 uh, thought robots will become human. <laughs> Robots did not really travel this path for different reasons, and we'll get into like advancement of science needed to do this uh, and, and where we are today. Robots didn't evolve like that. It, it was a human-like human model for robots. Robots become our industrial partners. Robots become partners in automation, and it needed a lot of improvements in computing, automation, materials, electronics, hydraulics to pneumatics to electric motors, all those things that needed to come, uh, but it didn't go like this. Argon has actually a very interesting legacy. Uh, this picture, 1948, Argon was the first place where telerobotics, so human operating the robot to perform a task. And then the electric servo manipulator was invented in Argon that then went into some of the robots of industrial robots. So Argon has a long legacy of robotics, and uh, we continue to pursue some of these things, but we'll get there uh, as we move along with the story. So the question becomes that what is happening to robots now, and how industry is starting to uh, use robots. I'm gonna play this movie. Uh, the movie itself is kind of FRM, another car company. I'm keeping the car story going. Um, but you will see that there is slight different in this robot. It more looks like your Roomba, but it does a lot more things. This is Skoda Auto's first fully autonomous robot, which is able to learn. The company has started now using it at the Skoda Auto Vrechlabi plant. The compact autonomous transportation system increases the efficiency of transporting parts between the measuring center and processing machines and it contributes to increased efficiency and safety at the plant. This is yet another sign of the plant's position as a state-of-the-art high-tech and technology location. The autonomous robot can transport a load of up to 130 kilograms and chooses the correct routes fully autonomously. Contrary to conventional driverless transportation systems, it does not require lane guidance in the form of induction loops or magnetic strips and does not need reflector guidance. To learn the route, the robot only needs to be guided between the stations once by tablet or joystick. It observes its surroundings and learns the rights of way. It can recognize changes in its environment by itself and adjust its route accordingly. So you can see that you know the robot here is a lot more smart. It is actually observing things around it and auto making decisions. Translate to higher so what I am talking about here is about this transformation of industry. The first picture was about Industry 1.0, your like, you know, factory, mills, uh, steam engine, uh, and, and the industry going through that process. The second industrial revolution, we played a big part in it, assembly line, the mass production that created the middle class and the industry 3.0, the automated production, and where robotics arm came in, and now we're starting to talk about industry 4.0, uh, 
where you see robots being smart, they're choosing, they're working with uh, humans, they're choosing and making their decisions, which is something we can do because we made a lot more in, uh, you know, advancement in science and engineering. But you know, the obvious question that you may have in your mind is that you know, what about job? What's happening to job? Did we lose job, gain job? That is always the most interesting question to most people. So let me address that because you know, we'll not get more time as we get into the science and other things. Let me address that first. So all this industrial revolution led to uh, displacement and job loss and shift of jobs. That is inevitable, and I think that will be inevitable for Industry 4.0. By some estimate, uh, between 1990 and 2007, US lost 670,000 jobs due to automation. So it was a net loss. But if you look at this, some economists will say that when you increase production, when you export, you grow economy, what you do is that you can hire more people and net job increases, which is true, but there is always a net loss of job due to disruptive technologies. So that's why we have to keep abreast of disruptive technologies. We have to put humans first, and we have to get ahead of changes that is coming. So in this talk, we'll talk about Industry 4.0, where Argon fits into the story, and how we can get our community ready for the coming changes and apply science in manufacturing. So that's kind of the context. How did we get here? You can imagine that we are this generation. We are looking at our phone. At this moment, many of you are getting a lot of work done in your handheld devices. And that's how we live. We have already crossed this path where we collaborate, we live with our machines. We live within a connected world. If you look at this, the uh, number of connected devices uh, crossed uh, num the population of the world around 2008, and we have projected towards this 26.3 billion devices that are interconnected devices. And this happened because during this time, what we lived through is another revolution, which is not a manufacturing revolution. It took a lot of changes, but that was the internet revolution. In some sense, there is enough data right now that we kind of went a little bit south on this. We did not increase productivity. We actually lost productivity <laughs> because we are very distracted right now. But it really changed manufacturing. Now, Industry 4.0, we are speaking about the world that is very connected, machines that are intelligent, machines that are collaborating with humans, and that's why we call it a cyber-physical world. So this is the loop between the machine that performs the work and a cyber infrastructure and the data layered on top of that. So you are now overlaying the data on top of your physical, and you are connecting the cyber physical loop. That's how the industry is changing, and that's how our, our factory floors are changing, and we're living through this industry 4.0, this industry, internet of things, connected machines, intelligent machines, and so on. All these terms that you hear and read about. So that is what we call the digitization of manufacturing. And in, in the concept, the, the digitization starts with the design. Now, all the designs are CADs and other things which are completely digital design. A lot of people do not have even co paper copies of machines. Even the older parts, we're doing 3D scanning, and we are making copies of those parts using the digital uh, instrumentation. Then we can simulate how these parts will uh, react to you know, use, uh, stress, or the function of putting things together. We can then model the behavior of the part. We can model the manufacturing itself. We can analyze. We can think about the control system that you need to have in order to make something, and then we can manufacture. So you can Im imagine this whole loop is a digital loop, and you have more and more shifting of work uh, to the digital side of things, and then the manufacturing is changing. As a result, you, you have this kind of factories, which are digital factories with all connected AI, uh, machine learning, robotics, sensors, and Internet of Things. It's a very, very high-tech factory floor. And people are investing a lot. There is a race right now to win this battle that where manufacturing goes. You have something called very advanced metrology, where you can make precise measurements that allows machines to make decisions. You are collecting lots of data. We have now the bandwidth to use this data. And we have smart computing algorithms that can make decisions or help humans make decisions. That's the kind of world that we live in right now. And that's where uh, you know, Argon starts to think about 
uh, when we start our manufacturing science and engineering initiative three years back. Our thought was in this world, we are a science lab, how we participate and use our science background, our background in everything else to really make an impact and help the community. When few different things happening at Argonne kind of helps us put the story together. One of them is probably you are aware that we are getting the first exascale machine, uh, Aurora, and this is part of that advanced computing initiative. Exascale is 10 to the power 18 computations per second. That's amazing power. This is one of the first exascale machines that we are investing in. The Department of Energy will have this, and you, you see the construction going all around us. And, it, and what it can do for us for doing manufacturing, that we have tremendous capacity to model, to analyze data, to look at machine learning, and all other algorithms. So that helps you to do the modeling, the simulations, the planning, and adding higher level calculations and physics-based models and science ideas into this. So there is a few different things in Argonne National Lab that I think that you know us for. One is we have strong links to our chemistry and physics background. So we come with strong legacy on chemistry and physics, but a lot of the knowledge that we have, it's a very lower length scale. We know how to move individual atoms. We know how they behave. We know the physics rules. But you need to establish a multi-scale link uh, to a battery that we are manufacturing, uh, to an electric car that we might be manufacturing someday, and how these atoms will behave under use conditions, and how can we make better batteries, better charging system, better fuel cells, better catalyst for cleaner environment, you name it. The middle part is interesting. It's called mesoscale. Mesoscale is kind of in between scale. Uh, why you need this mesoscale model? Because all the things that are moving, the flow, the flow of fluids and things that are happening now can be modeled using large computers. We can use thousands of processors and we can very clearly design new fluids that will have a very different hydraulic response, for example, compared to the old fashioned petroleum based hydraulic fluid or silicon based hydraulic fluids. So you can make now designer fluids if you can connect how to change atoms and then make mesoscale changes. That changes a lot of things in manufacturing, especially when you are making things in a big reactor. You are flowing, you are mixing, you are reacting. These things are very hard to track. Now the computer models are helping us, helping Argon researchers every day to really design flow better, how to mix better, how to reduce time to get to your product. This in turn helps a manufacturer who wants this technology from Argon to leverage these capabilities in their manufacturing line. So this scientific research helps. The third part is getting more interesting. In this digital world, um, what you have is a multi-physics model. So you're coupling all kinds of physics, like how the thermal flow happens, how the fluid flow happens, how the reactor, it's, it's a nuclear reactor core changes with use, and all kinds of models that you can now model digitally and say that how I can change the design to increase the lifetime of a product. This is called digital twin. So you're not really manufacturing a product. You are making the product, you are modeling the product, adding all the physics of the use, and you are making the product better. And you can do it at an amazing rate because of the supercomputer. I'll give you one story. I mean, the, your standard internal combustion engine in the car you just drove here, uh, if it is still internal combustion engine, <laughs> you still we're doing a lot of engine modeling research. One of the researchers here ran 10,000 models of variation of engine to find which engine will have most efficient com combustion to really predict the cleanest, most fuel efficient engine. That is unthinkable uh, even 10 years back when there was no computer that can run 10,000 engine models that are running and optimizing the chemistry and the nozzles and geometries. So it is opening up a huge space which we never opened. We never knew the how a model should look like. We never experimented with it. So now computers can change those model and suggest to you what is the best model you should be making. And that opens huge door of opportunity for research. So what I'm trying to say that these changes are also opening up tremendous amount of opportunities for new product that we should be really, uh, really embracing uh, to get into, get, take advantage of industry 4.0. So let's come to the main topic of this talk, that 
how science itself changed the manufacturing. Because we saw it through the lens of industry that how automation changed and how everything changed outwardly. But scientific innovation, new materials, and manufacturing methods are right, really intertwined. Because if you think about when George Duvall was making that robot in 1954, he had a magnetic drum memory. And he wrote the total of 10 line of today's equivalent of code, right? So essentially, his machine can do a simple repetitive task because he can only program that much. Because memory was limited, and it was pneumatic. It's very clunky. Electric motor was not there. So think about what, where we have come. So there is a tremendous change in the memory capacity, power, uh, because everything that is not connected to a wire is now powered by battery, lithium-ion batteries. A lot of this research done at Argonne Rational Lab has pushed the, the envelope in lithium ions and how long things can last. So for example, the cell phone you are holding. That is a 1990s supercomputer, by the way. <laughs> but this 1990s supercomputer that you're holding in your hand, uh, the first one in 1992, which you can call a touchscreen smartphone, was by IBM. It's called Simon. Simon could last one hour, right? And Simon could make calls. It has a touch screen. Um, but it, it, it said in a proud letters that if you really want to make a good call, you can connect to your wall socket and make a landline call. <laughs> so that's how far we have come from the smartphone of 1992 the, and compared to what you're holding. And technology, the touch screen, that everything that science allowed. Indium tin oxide in 1960 led to the capacitive touch screen, the LED, the, every research that you hold in a hand. It is connected to the science, the basic science that is done here. Same is true for manufacturing. One thing, one example I will give you is lasers. This is 1960, then when the laser was, and we talk, all know about lasers, but when Shallow and Towns you know, was issued a patent in laser, I don't think they realized that it will be supporting a $17 billion industry because it was funded by Air Force Office Basic Science Grant. They were told that, you know, figure out what you can do with this stimulated emission. We don't think it is very useful, but maybe someday Air Force will use it. Little did we know that now it is supporting a uh, $17 billion industry. So, and I will give you one example where this laser is everywhere in, uh, in, in manufacturing. And one example you probably didn't heard about is 3D printing. So let me show some things about 3D printing in Argonne and how we're using laser to now make new parts. And with any arbitrary design you choose in your computer using a, digi a digital model. So this is our Argon's work. So in this 3D printing, what you saw is the laser doing the manufacturing. It is drawing essentially layer by layer the complex 3D model, and it is controlling the laser. We are taking it to the advanced photon source. That is your football field size uh, X-ray source. We are using it to observe it at millionth or a thousandth of a second rate. We are observing how closely, how well we are making something. This was not possible five years before by anybody else in the world. We did it in Argonne. We can observe this. We can use new materials because we can observe it. We can control it. So in our manufacturing initiative, the advanced photon source become a big asset. So our, it is undergoing renovation. In, by 2026, it will be the brightest in the world again. And what brightest means is that there is lots of extra produced. It can go through things, and you can do manufacturing while you are making things. You can observe. You can control connected to the computing capabilities, and you can come up with new ways of making things. That opens the door 
to Argonne National Lab, industry already heavy user of advanced photon source, and we can look into the next chapter of this history, including the way we are doing 3D printing right now. So the bending magnets bends the uh, X-ray beam, and all these hutches that you see in different parts of this advanced photon source, you can stand your a version of your manufacturing machine a lot of X-ray can penetrate through metals and other objects, or even electronics, or even biomaterials, and you can really observe polymers, metals, composites, anything you name it, while you are making it. In situ observation, you learn from it, and you can model it. This is another example um, that kind of connects manufacturing uh, to, uh, so this is a model of an internal combustion engine, then nozzles. This is not a model, this is the real nozzles that does fuel injection in the engine. Some company made this model and we scanned it using 3D scanning. We can do a lot of fast scanning and we can then observe the fuel spray. We really found there's a design changes you can make to make this nozzle much more efficient by observing it in the APS, by modeling it in the, in the computers and then iterating through the design. So this is a new world of manufacturing where we can change design we can look at complex flow of fluids, which is previously not seen, because you've never seen inside of an engine how the fluid spray works, right? So now you can do that in the extra beam, and you can observe. So that brings us to the current nature of the Manufacturing Science and Engineering Initiative. It's a cross-cutting effort uh, that connects different parts of the uh, laboratory. Some of us does physics, some of us, you know, materials, chemistry, uh, engineering, nuclear engineering, reactor design, if you look at all the lab, we want to establish a leadership in science-based approach to manufacturing because we have the tools to observe it. We have the ability to actually innovate because we have the scientists and the smartest mind who can really innovate using the great tools and the people we have. And what we want to do is that one key to our competitiveness is to come up with products that can win in the world market. You cannot win in the world market don't have the best of science and best of technology behind you. And thus, Argonne National Lab, we want to be that leading edge and reduce the time it takes to come up with new products, test them in our advanced photon source, use our computers and other capabilities. If you look at where we sit, we are in Midwest, we are really blessed with best of universities. And we want to establish a Midwest hub. If you look at universities around us, if you go through this list, this is all, all the about publication, people we already work with. You can see Northwestern, University of Chicago, Urbana-Champaign, Purdue, from the list in the rank. We're really in a 300 miles radii. We have the best of minds. We have the students and the faculty that works with Argonne already at, on manufacturing and materials and chemistry. So we have this huge network. Um, so we are leveraging that, bringing them in and working with us with, with, with universities and industry to build the next manufacturing systems, and in the process, uh, training the next generation of workforce. Because, because the next generation workforce are gonna drive this innovation and keep us in the leadership. So what we are doing at this Manufacturing Science and Engineering Initiative, or MSEI, we know a lot about how to make things. We know a lot of, about energy storage. Argonne has a strong li legacy in battery science, energy storage, energy conversion water purification, catalysis, all the systems are multi-billion dollar industries that we think that we can really help uh, to shorten the time it takes to come up with the new materials, new product, and new process technologies. So we want to help accelerate innovation uh, using in-situ measurements that you saw, advanced photon source, sensing, a lot of new sensors were going on, machine learning and modeling in the exascale. We want to generate a lot of insights about material synthesis that feed back into discovery science. We may not have the right material to get the best product. And we can always say, if we make the thing and say that, hey, you know, if, you, if only this thing did this, I can capture a new market. I can open new doors. That allows us to really ask those questions. And you always have to go back to basic science and discovery science and go to the other researcher in the lab and say that, can we imagine a material that did this, right? So this loop is a virtuous cycle that helps us generate new ideas, new materials, and help us impact of the lab on the community as a whole and industry and the manufacturing. So this is kind of what we call the basis of Argonne's version of next generation of American manufacturing where we can help. 
let's talk about some of the capabilities that we are growing. Um, Greg Kramnik, uh, you know, introduced me. He's behind creation of this materials engineering research facility, MRF. Uh, this is one of the unique facilities in the country that looks at scaling of these materials that you can only make in small quantities in you know, university labs or basic science lab. But you, industry can only use it if you de-risk it, show that you can make it in right quantities, in right quality, at the right cost, and you can get to that point. So many of our discovery doesn't go to the industry because the middle piece is missing. MARF was our answer to this middle piece. We can develop materials, scalable materials in kilogram quantities that is, cannot be done in a university or anywhere else. They're contracting companies, but they will you know, take you so much money that a small businessman or a, a small a new entrepreneur cannot even afford to do it. It also enables commercial ev evaluation, accurate cost modeling, because we are using in these different labs the capabilities that are very comparable to industries. So your cost is going to be something that industry uses. So if you look at what MARF has grown in past 10 years, and it has worked with many, many industries and universities and national labs, and really given us uh, this strong launch pad for this manufacturing initiative. Uh, because we have really shown that a national lab can provide not only that's concepts from the basic science and new materials and discovery science, new battery, you name it, and new ways of looking at things in, uh, in our advanced photon source, we can also scale them so that they can be usable. They can be put in a car, they can be put in an EV battery, or they can work in a flow battery um, that is for large scale grid scale storage. That is the story that MARF started, and we're really proud of MARF, and we want to really augment that through this manufacturing in initiative, and Argon is investing in open in really coming up with this next generation of facility, and the construction is right now going on. So this was the green part is our old MARF, and this right part is expansion, so we are adding 15,000 more square feet uh, of floor space with more of this industrial quality instrumentation for material scale up processing. We are connecting these machines and instrumenting them for doing science, having really high time and spatial resolution information on things that make things that industry doesn't have. So that industry can come to us and say that, oh, I want to use your system to see how we scale something. And we're establishing a lot of these collaborations. This, this facility is under construction. This MARF expansion, oh, the, 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 you know, the construction will be over in November. So hopefully when things warm up, we'll start inviting people over again for another event like this, where we'll introduce you to this manufacturing initiative and all the capabilities and have a good uh, show of things that what we are trying to build here. So what is new? Uh, what is new is this, I'm going back to the first part of my story. We're still living in an industry 4.0 world. We want, although we are doing material scale up process synthesis, our world looks like industry 4.0 because we have connected all the sensors that we have developed. We have connected the data. We have connected the physics model and making it available to the researcher when they're doing experiments so that they can make better decisions. So this is not about automation. It's about AI machine learning augmenting human capacity for innovation. We want human to make better decisions, aided by machines, computing, and every possible aid. I'll give you one example. We have a system. Uh, it's called a flame spray system. And it's one of the many things that is going on in more. It goes on electro deposition, atomic layer deposition. There are too many to go through. Flame spray is like a giant flamethrower. Essentially, what it does is that it burns a bunch of precursors and liquid in a gas flame and then produces things at kilograms per hour. It's, it's a large instrument. And we have instrumented each part of that thing. And it's a very complex instrument to handle. But think about industry 4.0 world. You have connected devices, you have connected sensors, and you have connected set of information that if available to human, we can make the time shorter, the time it takes to really optimize to make the exact thing we want to make. So this is one of the things that we are building. This is like a dashboard. You can see all the temperature sensor in this instrument giving us the reading. You can see that this is the giant flame, but it is only you know, doing imaging, but it's very fast. It's really imaging the chemistry, not the flame. We have video cameras that are imaging the optical image, but this is, can image the chemistry in this flame. What's going on in which part of the... So you can focus on a particular chemistry or particular thing that you want to make, and you can tweak the things to make this. 
So these are the kind of things we're building, and these are reusable. You can use it, you can take it, you can put your instrument back into this framework, and you can track what you are making, how you are making it. And if you want, you have Exascale Computer coming soon that you can model all of it and provide you even better what if questions without ever turning it on, right? So it saves money because computing is a renewable resources and it saves money and it gives you a lot of better idea so that we can outcompete others to get into the product faster and cheaper. So this is the space where we are building. This is the model, but soon it will be reality. Uh, construction is going on full scale. Uh, we want a science-based manufacturing with human in the loop because we think that all the technology and the science that we have, we want to use it to the, go to the next level. We don't want to just hit a button and go home. We want to be part of this story. We want humans to really learn, do new things, and become part of this manufacturing story. So just to wrap up, the need is to uh, take all this knowledge, all these capabilities we are developing to Argon internal investment, how we can help to you know, work with others and make it accessible. If you look at large companies, Lockheed, Boeing, you know, large company, they can afford large computers. They can do design in any ways. Uh, they have all the computers, they sometimes come to us, but this is possible for them. But the question is, what about the little guy, right? That guy is like the local entrepreneur is really fighting an uphill battle because they don't have a supercomputer, they do not have the money. What we think we can do is that help all this entrepreneurial community. You probably heard about chain reaction innovation. So we are really encouraging uh, the entrepreneurs and innovators to work with us. Uh, and you know, this is taxpayer funded computing. It helps us to really help you. So we can engage in, in, in the local community. And this manufacturing facility, when it opens up, I think that it provides us a ground uh, to in, interact with a lot of local company and help uh, our communities. So why we need to do that? Because if you look at building a community um, that can take advantage of Industry 4.0, we need to be ready for it, right? Otherwise, everybody running this race, uh, we want the products to be made in Illinois. The recent change is actually going in that direction. In between, we send the products out to far places to made, get made and ship them back. But the manufacturing supply chain is coming back to local communities. You have the fab labs, you have the maker spaces, you have the community-oriented manufacturing that is going on every day, touching every part of the community. One thing we need to impart is the knowledge. How we win in the world market is our ability to look at it using extra amazing length scale, our ability to use computing, use MRF, use the capabilities. So, so we think that this is, a, this is a launching pad for training a lot of people. This is summertime. If you go walk around our street, you will see lots of students in Argonne. They're everywhere. They're in our engineering labs. They're, they are in summer labs. So students from different parts of the country are coming to Argonne and learning different parts of the science and the engineering. And we believe that slowly will transform into how to make things. So that when they go back, we have trained our next generation uh, to take up the mantle and make, make us competitive again. So one last thought, I'll leave with this. So we talked about Industry 4.0. We're a little late to the party. But we are really making progress. We are using science to out-innovate, out-compete, out-smart others, and at the, in the same time, generating lots of good basic science a part of our mission of Argonne National Lab. So the next frontiers in manufacturing science is what we also look at. We also don't look at just immediate next five to 10 years. You can imagine this every one of this industrial revolution will, is lasting shorter and shorter. The first one lasted 150 years, then the next one was 70 years, the next one was 30 years. Industry 4.0 is gonna be soon 5.0 because rate of change uh, is faster and faster and faster. So Argon National Lab, uh, if we look at the future, where it is going, how the 5.0 will look like, we believe that there is a vanishing line. Now the devices are getting smaller, the computers are becoming edge computers and they're making decisions. And it, things are getting smaller and smaller and smaller that we have a slowly, slowly, slowly vanishing the line between what is a material, what is a sensor, and what is a computer. So the world we are going towards in a world where materials are going to be smart, you, they're going to have a certain amount of computing capability. If you look at neuromorphic computing and other low power computing, that will mean that your, this thing will feel your touch may even say that don't touch me, <laughs> right? So this kind of smartness or the ability to interact with the environment 
or reducing consumption when power is not needed. This will be embedded in a smaller and smaller length scales, and eventually it will vanish the line between what is a material, what is a computing, and what is a sensor. It will be all one thing. So I believe that that's where we are going, the industry 5.0. Argon is well positioned to really champion the cause of, because we can see atoms at the lowest possible length scale. At the CNM, we can move single atom at a time. We can measure single atom at a time. So we are ahead for this world. At the same time, we want to, of course, make sure that our computing, our capabilities for industry 4.0 is helping. Of course, this whole effort takes a big team. We really engaged hundreds of researchers across the lab. So this tremendous support from the lab leadership, internal investment in manufacturing initiative, because this is a new thing. We didn't do it before. We did it in different forms, but we didn't call it the way we want to guide it and, and take ownership of the problem. So we are going after this. We are engaging the researcher. We are engaging the community. We are engaging the industry. We are engaging our university partners in the Midwest. I thank especially uh, the people that I work with. Uh, Suresh Sundar Rajan is the associate lab director. Uh, and Greg Kramdick is a great uh, you know, colleague and uh, inspiration, and we co-lead this in initiative. And Aaron Fluitt, I point to him, uh, he has been really helping us, really interacting with industry, the focusing where we are going, and, and, and have a lot of innovative, great ideas. So I really encourage you, when this talk ends, uh, to really seek out Greg, Aaron, uh, to talk more if you have more questions. Thank you so much for coming. I really appreciate your time and hope I made an understanding of where we are going with manufacturing with the science-based manufacturing. Thank you. Thank you, Santanu. A fascinating talk on where manufacturing is going and how Argons can help get us there. We have time for a few questions. There's ushers in the aisles with microphones. If anyone has a question, please raise your hand, and they'll uh, wait for the uh, microphone so that everyone could hear. Rapid prototyping, reducing the expense and the time to come to market. It seems that that'll have a significant effect on how we define the manufacturer. Could be a one-man band because of that reduction. Is that part of what Argonne's gearing toward? Is really serving the smaller entrepreneur, the redefining what a manufacturer is? So the rapid prototyping, we have many partners that are working with Argonne in rapid prototyping. So one of the partners we have is uh, MIT, who came up with this concepts of Fab Lab. And Argonne is partnering with them to work with them and with the working with Makerspace and working uh, with mHub uh, to look at the rapid prototyping problem. What we offer to the rapid prototyping is our ability to measure and our ability to essentially look at uh, the better way to manipulate prototyping problems. So we do not have a, uh, if you're asking if we have a commercial facility where industry can come in with a model and we can make it, I think that we have many other partners who are doing it much more effectively uh, than we are doing. Uh, so that was not exactly our, uh, our role right now, but we are helping them. We're helping them with computing, with modeling, and we're helping them how to make things and what are the new materials that you can use to make a rapid prototyping. So we are part of the story, but we don't drive the rapid prototyping at this point. But we have engineering services, we have 3D printing capabilities, but going forward, uh, we will slowly, slowly start to see that what are the needs that Argon can fulfill that are probably not met by others. Thank you. I, I have like a million questions because you just blew me away. But um, my biggest question is like whenever we have scientific innovation, we have the ability to use it for positive or negative. And you talked a lot about the manufacturing of engines like for Boeing and cars and whatnot. Are you doing any partnering with healthcare instrumentation manufacturers? Like, um, you know, the PET scan would be a very useful tool, but it's way too expensive to even get into the mainstream. And there's a lot of need in healthcare for those kinds of manufacturing. I think that you know we help uh, with different parts of the instrumentation that gets, gets into making a PET scanner. <laughs> so we're kind of on the side, the things that go in into a PET scanner. 
So we look at miniaturization of X-ray sources. We look at how to uh, build really precise devices that are implantable in very small scale. Uh, that, so we have different aspects of it. So work gets done in advanced photon source in this domain uh, all the time. There are different researchers working on it. Uh, so, but what you are asking that if we make it is one of the thrust areas. So I think it is one of the biggest needs we're in discussion that how we can approach uh, the biomedical industry. That's uh, a very interesting question, right? It's a very growing field and a big need. Yeah. yeah. Greg, you, you want to add anything? The, the human genome project that, that Berkeley is coordinating, it, it needs massive amounts of supercomputing capabilities and, and that can help translate into systems to automatically make medications and make drugs just by seeing what what the, the problems are. So there, there's a lot of opportunities there. And it, it's just about convincing the right government sources for funding to uh, continue that work. <laughs> no, it's getting bigger. Because it's getting bigger. That's how you make them more powerful. <laughs> and also, <laughs> X-ray is a thing that is hard to miniaturize and also increase the flux and also increase the, all the harder and harder things we want to go through and image faster and faster. So the, the demand is that you know, somebody's making it in a millionth of a second. Can you give them a movie version? The one you saw in the movie for additive manufacturing is actually a millionth of a second uh, movie each frame. It looks like it's happening fast. It's happening really fast. And you can see a metal melt, freeze, form defects, everything in that high time resolution. That needs a big ring. <laughs> and we like it. <laughs> but I think that I, I totally take your point. Lab sources are growing tremendously. So the amount of 3D scanning that you can do for tomography machines that are lab scale desktop sources, they can really scan things at a very high rate that are desktop. You don't need the APS. But the APS is a very specialized uh, you know, work that, that gives us a, 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 an ability to probe things in many different ways, using lasers, with x-ray, with photons, with reactions happening, in situ measurements, why do we do things? So it has a different function, but I think the direction you were saying that there is effort in miniaturization, and lab sources have improved tremendously uh, over the years. And a lot of the analytical tools we're using didn't exist 10 years ago. Uh, a benchtop scanning electron microscope now is, can fit on your desk, where 10 years ago it, it was the size of a desk, and a, an NMR was, was the whole room. Whole now room. you can now set it on a table. So the, the equipment is getting more powerful and smaller, which is making it cheaper so we can have it in labs that we didn't have access to before, which opens up whole new ways of using that equipment. So that allows us to instrument a lot of these systems because we can put equipment in places that would never have fit before. I think we have a question in the back. Yeah, I commend Argon for these advances. This is fantastic. I'd like to clarify a point you made and then ask a follow-up question. You made a point, we are late to the party. Are you referring to Argonne, or are you referring to the United States? Uh, country, yes. Argonne? No, country as a whole. Country as a whole. Yeah, we, because Industry 4.0 got defined by Germany. Right. Okay. And you know that. It, and uh, we jumped in, and we said that, yeah, we, we are going to do it. We, as you can see, that in previous cases, we drove the innovation. Industry 4.0, although we had the IoT and everything, the, all the sensors, we had all the pieces. Germany really yeah, packaged it and called it universe, Industry 4.0. Uh, it's slightly more than that. They invested in it. Uh, their Fraunhofer Institutes and other institutes really worked together. I think that we will, we will get there. It's not a problem. We have all the capabilities, all the smarts. It's just we are slightly late in starting to define our story and what we are going to do about it. Uh, the follow-up question is the geopolitical forces. There are lots of nations who are voracious consumers of the kind of information you're now developing. Are they also generating the information and contributing to what you know and what others know in order to get us there faster? I think that, yes, the world has become an interconnected uh, group of uh, contributors, that, and research is coming from many different places. Uh, some, not all knowledge is developed in Argonne. Not all instrumentation is developed in Argonne. So it's a network of people. 
um, that is contributing to this, absolutely. So our knowledge is definitely developed, but what we are trying to do is taking the knowledge to the next level and use the basic science knowledge for making something that is unique, can be proprietary, right? Or not all things that is open <laughs> are good. <laughs> you still have to sell it to somebody and somebody needs to pay for it. If it, is, if it can be copied, then it's not good, good. But you are using the knowledge and the people that we have and the capabilities to we have to make something unique and uh, win the you know, competitiveness argument for the, for the country. We got a question over here. Um, it's, we all know you have limited resources, limited funding. So could you explain the process and what the main factors are that how you determine what way to go? Or is it just commercially driven? So part of it is depending on who's funding the work. If the Department of Energy is funding it, then they have a lot of influence on what research is being done. They, they get to decide where the money is going. We can work with companies direct. Companies will pay us, and then we will do the work for them, assuming we can get DOE's approval for it. So in that sense, if they, they bring in the money, then we will do the research with them. There's other, a lot of opportunities for startups where they may not have enough funds to work with the National Lab, but there's a lot of DOE programs where startups can engage with DOE in order to get the funds to engage with the National Labs. There's many programs like that, and we have a lot of small startups and, and entrepreneurs that we're working with to help give their companies a, a boost using the capabilities and experience of the labs. So we've, we've got quite a few of those, and, and they're, they're growing because there's just a lot of interest from that community to take advantage of the infrastructure we have here. You know, for a small company, it, it is a make and break for it to do the proof of concept and to get to a product that actually works. And for a lot of companies that are working with us, embedding with us, they're essentially getting a voucher to work with us and use our services from some outside sources from DOE. And this model worked really well uh, for uh, you know, the chain reaction innovations. And there are companies, people who are embedded in our labs working with us, prototyping and proving it out. And they're talking to all the people, which is kind of doesn't take any money. You walk into somebody's office and say that, hey, I have this idea. How can you help me solving this part of the problem? So we are always happy to help. And we like this group of entrepreneurs. And I think that this is a growing set of activities. So I think that this needs more funding. So I'm definitely. <laughs> supportive of increasing such activities from the Department of Energy side. Oh, sure. There are two technologies that have the power to change the world. One would be uh, superconductivity at room temperature, <laughs> okay? And another one would be a super battery. Now, I know Argonne launched the 555 project. We're a couple of years, several years into that. So could you give us uh, a status update on where we are with that and uh, with both of those technologies? Take 555. So on the, the 555 program you're referring to is Jay Caesar. This right. is the, the uh, fundamental research program that uh, the basic office of science is funding. It's actually into its second five years right now. And it, it's been a huge success in the terms of generating a tremendous amount of data collaborating with five national labs and five universities and five companies in order to really build a great foundation in beyond lithium ion, what's coming next. So the, the, the focus for the second five years is really to, to really push that envelope into what, what is going to happen next. Because lithium ion is has got a lot of life left in it. There's a tremendous amount of research being going on right now here at Argonne on what are the next generation lithium ion batteries. But DOE wants to see, well, in 10 years from now, what, what is going to be next? So that, that's really where that program is pushing. I really don't know about the superconducting materials, but I, I'm sure. Um, so I think that we had a Energy Frontier Research Center uh, led by Mike Norman uh, on the FRC. So my colleagues, uh, physics colleagues in Arbana was part of it. Uh, so that has discovered a lot of new phases. Some of the latest one that we're talking about is superconducting in room temperature, but at a very high pressure. So you have to really compress the thing hard. So there are, there are certain ways that we are still sort of getting there. It's one of those things that there is new discoveries, new effort, but we're not quite there where you can have a maglev at room temperature and you don't have to get it to a liquid nitrogen temperature. Liquid nitrogen temperature is available, uh, but room temperature, even higher is available, 100 something degree Kelvin, which is 200 below. 
is possible. Uh, but room temperature, we still have some squeezing to do <laughs> at a high pressure. It's something simple, uh, like magnesium hydride showed superconductivity. And so there were a lot of research results. Uh, but where we come from, we call it technology maturation level, or TRL, technology readiness level. So I would say these are all TRL one or two ideas. And to, for becoming technology, we need more and more in, that in the middle block uh, where we sit. So definitely <laughs> two important things. But I think everybody, the people working in this field is working hard. So I don't want them to be disheartened. But they, they are doing a great job. So I think we'll get there. Um, thank you for a very interesting lecture, and I'm very happy to see that the Out Loud lecture series is happening again. Um, the, you mentioned that the MRF expansion is to be completed by November of this year. Did I hear the APS to be completed by 2026? And if so, why is that such a long time? If you would elaborate, please. <laughs> okay. It's a, it's a mile long thing, right? And we are upgrading it to the latest of magnets. So you have to procure thousands of magnets. <laughs> you have to put them into place, and you have to zone them off. You cannot turn the whole thing off for years, because people are still using it. Uh, so there is a staged way we are going at it. And also, there is a procurement going on right now. Like $80, $100 million worth of things are bought and procured and put into place. So it's a massive undertaking to upgrade something like APS. I was in Brookhaven. Brookhaven and SLS2 took similar yeah. amount of time. And there is a very unnerving period where there is no beam and you're turning the new thing on. Uh, we're going to get there sometime. But I think Argon's plan is a little bit better because it is going to ready parts of it separately. And we're going go to go to full-fledged APSU, what we, we are calling it, upgraded APS uh, in 2026. And, but the process has started. It's a long process. And it takes a lot of engineering, a lot of construction, a lot of change in the power and other requirements. So cooling, power, everything. <laughs> and really, the, the MRF expansion is a facility. It's a building that's being built for us to do the research in. The, the APS upgrade is building the tool itself, building a, a world-class complex machine that has millions of parts that, that all need to work together. So it, it's really a completely different type of, a, of a, an upgrade. <laughs> Thank you. Excellent question. So we have a very strong and growing education program. Uh, so if each summer, we have a Sully program is, that funds 400-something students. We have close to 1,000 students if you add the users of APS. We have high school programs. We have hacker labs where they come and have the lab. So the activity that is going on in the STEM education, and I'm an educator, so I, I really with you. We need to get our next generation ready for everything that we are doing. Engaging student uh, is, is, is the first way to do it. So we have cohort of manufacturing summer students, which are undergrads from universities around us. And we're paying them and including them in our lab. They're getting, working with us this summer like any other summer. So, and high school is also part of different programs. In a battery, there is a club and there is a, a, there's a camp on making batteries. And there is another one on, uh, on hacking and computing and other things. So we want to launch one in manufacturing for, uh, for even high school students. We want to launch it on sustainable manufacturing, green manufacturing circular economy, locally sourced materials. So we have lots of activities in our pipeline in the student. So I think that if you look at the breadth of our student activity, and we have a web page, I would encourage you to take a look at what we are doing. I think that it's really large. <laughs> and you cannot walk right now in our, and go to Argonne Cafeteria without bumping into a student, literally. <laughs> So I think DOE encourages encouraging a lot of STEM, uh, and funding is coming through. And DOE is more and more pushing STEM education, education grants, working with university, starting master's program, starting bachelor's program. Uh, recently, they started a, a internship in robotics, because we believe that we have less and less people. So we competed. We won, won a bunch of money for that. 
and we recruited students from different schools around the country, and they are in the lab in our robotics program. So, uh, so DOE is, uh, you know, you can say that, you know, it's 40 students internship, like how large is that? But I think that there's a push for different directions. So it's like, uh, we're seeing a lot more activity actually. Uh, it's a growing uh, need and I think DOE is helping. And, and DOE has a highly coordinated program for, for graduate students and undergraduates, but then when you get to the high school and, and younger, the, the, the labs have different levels of, of expertise, so it's a little bit more on their own once you get to the, the younger students. Um, that's a great question. Additive is changing rapidly. Uh, subtractive is changing rapidly. Hybrid manufacturing is growing. Binder jet printing is growing. This is a field of innovation that which one wins out is very hard to say. But when it comes to big parts, right, you don't want to use additive manufacturing because that is the most expensive way of making something. It comes to certain industries when you have a certain thing that you cannot really manufacture with, in, with using anything else. You want to go to additive manufacturing. When you want to reduce number of parts you have, because a lot of parts means by reliability engineering, a lot of different things can fail. 3D printing is allowing it to the single structure, multi-material structures, complex structures that cannot be done by subtractive manufacturing. So all these things has their own place. Uh, you don't want to do a low cost thing uh, using additive manufacturing. That's the most expensive way of doing things. Uh, if you want to really win business, you shouldn't be doing that. But at the same time, if you look at GE Global Research and other people, they're coming up with multi-laser systems. Multi it is, the speed is increasing. Speed is increasing for additive manufacturing is a rapid rate. Cost is dropping with everything else. I think that they will eventually be together, additive and subtractive. You had to kind of do the whole thing. Thank you, good question. More question, actually. Um, so how do you determine the moment when an industrial revolution is taking place? How do you determine the actual <laughs> transition? Oh. <laughs> you, uh, <clears throat> so you know, let's put it two, two ways. First of all, the industry 4.0, we're in the middle of it. And before we called it industry 4.0, we were in the middle of it. Only somebody for their competitive advantage was not telling what they're doing. So now we defined it. Now the money is pouring in, investment pouring in. You know things in artificial intelligence right now. You know there is 10,000 academic publication a year, which has grown exponentially. So all this knowledge is pouring in. We're in the middle of it, and generally when you're in the middle of it, you don't feel it. But at the same time, I think this one we can feel it a little better uh, because it, it, the wave hit harder things change around us, and the rate of change is faster. So we felt it better compared to many other ones. So I think that some breakthrough, when it comes, it's disruptive. It needs to be commercially viable. It needs to have a business case before a lot of people join in, somebody makes money, a big group of people make money, and you start the next one. <laughs> so that's, I, I, but there is no good way to tell. I, you're absolutely right. <laughs> Revolution is kind of like that. You get swept up in it sometimes. <laughs> Okay, if no more question, uh, thanks a lot. Thanks again, we'll be around, we'll be mingling, so please feel free to reach out to us. Uh, thanks everybody, I thank Angela. Thank you. Thank you.